Jenge glossy as we need See as it over baba Tina city uing Kosi as a Ungum dali Walum flaba Ubu sapant na pezul Konke kumi gawe mbaba Katama Jenge Glossy as we need see as a toba Pambi Baba Tina City Uing Kosi as Ungum Tali Walum Shaba Ubu Sapans Napesu
center of my being and though there be storms in me I anchor my gaze on you Father you're all I need the center of my being and though there be storms in And I will love you, I will trust you, keeper of my heart. I will come now, I will bow down, never be apart. And I will love you, I will trust you.
Lift one more. 
Four says, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around them, and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory, give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, O Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and they were created. And Father, today we say worthy, 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 24 seven, Lord, we lay down our crowns and we say worthy, 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 holy, holy. Holy are you, Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. Give us a new revelation, Lord, of your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Hello, every nation, family, South Africa. My name is Tim Johnson. I'm the senior pastor of Orlando World Outreach Center. I bring you greetings from Orlando and Orlando World Outreach Center. It is an honor to be here, uh, actually quite a privilege. Uh, it's been a long time coming, uh, speaking to Pastor Roger and Pastor Simon for the last couple of years about being a part of the work that I know uh, the Father has not only begun and begin to accelerate, but will increase in the days to come. And 
So I'm humbled and privileged. Um, I'm a man who's got more than I deserve, and I want to show you the evidence of that with my family. Um, on this photo, you'll see my wife and I, and two to the, the, to the right of me and two to the left of me. Uh, the uh, young lady next to me is my oldest daughter, um, Krista Johnson. She's a uh, fashion, works for a fashion design company in New York City, Carolina Herrera. And Kayla next to her uh, does original content as well as uh, a social producer for ESPN. And then the daughter between my son and um, my wife is our communications director for Orlando World Outreach Center. My son is a student at Full Sail University. Um, yes, uh, as of now, they all are still single and believing for covenant blessings from Abraham to come upon us. If you would, let's pause wherever you are. Just pause for a moment and consider the word of God. Give our attention to Matthew chapter 16. We'll read from verse 13 to 18, and I'll be reading out of the ESV. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my father who is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will or shall not prevail against it. Father, thank you for your word. We trust you today. For Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, who brought us back to you, that we would know and feel your affection and delight in us as your children. And then he allowed the power of your spirit to abide in us and to be released through us to declare and proclaim your kingdom. Come Holy Spirit to every heart and life and conform us into the image of the Lord Jesus. In Christ's name, amen. I live in Florida. Many of you live across South Africa, but we have something in common. And what we have in common is a lot of unanswered questions. We're living in the day of having far more questions than Google and Yahoo can handle. There's so many things that are important to us, our families, our jobs, that we have questions about that we don't see and have answers for. And those answers are critical. But we, we in a time like this, have to make sure we're asking the right questions. Because if you follow the rabbit trail of a, of a question that leads to some kind of emotional charge or emotional uh, proof that you're right about something, then we live our lives away from what the most important question we can have today is what is the Lord doing in the world? What is he doing on the earth? What is it? There's so many things that we can give our attention to, but there is no greater priority, I believe, for the people of God than to ask that question, what is the Lord doing? And then to lock in on what that answer is. And no time that I've been alive has been more critical than these days to not only know what the Lord is doing, but to participate in what he's doing and ask the question knowing that the answer has already been given. The answer has been given. Well, what's the answer? We just read it. If we ever want to know what the Lord is doing, it is this. He's building his church. And what I want to actually communicate to you today, the title of this message, is faith for a move of God. Because Jesus, when you look at Jesus' introduction to the world, yes, in a manger in Bethlehem. But the introduction to his ministry started this way, somewhere in Matthew 4. He says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of God is near. I'm coming to introduce to you the realm of the unseen in the realm of the seen. Jesus 
was the embodiment of a move of God. And he came as the embodiment of a move of God to establish his kingdom. And now we see Jesus communicating more specifically how he was going to extend his kingdom. And it was through the outpost called the church. And this is critical to understand because there were, there were, there was a resistance. There were powers. There were rulers that governed the affairs of men that Jesus came and disrupted the destruction of his creation. And in proclaiming the kingdom, he proclaimed it with truth and with power. Over and over again, when you read the scriptures, you see Jesus speaking the truth, correcting whether it was the Pharisees or Sadducees or or Peter, who right after this wonderful moment says, no, you're not going to die. He was always speaking the truth, but he also brought with the truth the power to demonstrate what the kingdom looks like. And so the same way Jesus came as the embodiment of a move of God to establish his kingdom and overpowering the darkness of this world, the realm of the dead, we need the same power to become the church because we still see remains, we still see evidence of the realm of the dead There's a lot of theological debate about what Hades represents, but you can't debate the fact that it means the realm of the dead. And it's what Jesus came to release his power to overcome. And so we find ourselves in a day where there's a lot of questions about what what we should be doing, what the Lord is doing. But this kind of clarity can energize our faith to say if he did it before, he'll do it again. And I love the fact in, uh, that in Matthew uh, chapter 16, Jesus is revealing how he's going to collect and, 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 and uh, 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 bring together this compilation of individuals from backgrounds and uh, differences in political opinions and, and differences in, in, in cultural ideas. He's going he's to merge this community of people together and call them the church. He's going to call them the church And he is going to be the one that takes responsibility for the church to be built in the world, which means as much as we want to advance the gospel and the message and our mission locally in whatever church you're in in right now, our social media campaigns, our video productions, our messages, our logos can, yes, reach people, but none of those things can prevail over the gates of hell like the power of God. There must be a move of God if we're going to overpower the realm of the dead, alternate lifestyles, hate, all the the, the poverty, all of the mental and emotional being overwhelmed, all of the things that come from the realm of the dead, even people just being spiritually dead and having no sense of responsiveness to God. There is a move of God that is absolutely needed, that is beyond our own ways of building and thinking that we can can have what God has for us in our strength, in our might, and in our own power, there is a move of God that is planned before the foundation of the earth that he has He is prepared and is preparing his people to come right into. We've seen trickles, but he's not done yet, so we're not done yet. And what we find in this Matthew chapter 16 is that Jesus gave attention to what everyone was saying, but he wanted to focus on what the disciples were saying because in order for the move of God to continue, that he started walking as the, uh, the tabernacle, the divinity and hu- humanity experience before all of the world. They saw God walking in the flesh. If he's going to continue to tabernacle among men, how's he going to do it? He had to leave and go away. It was going to be through his church. He says, I'm going to tabernacle with you, which began with 12 outcasts, individuals that none of us would pick maybe for leadership right off the bat. But what he was saying is, in order for what I want to do to advance my kingdom through the outposts of the church, I have to prepare some people. And these people that he prepared would have been social misfits. 
And I love how, how Jesus is always taking something from nothing and making this, this thing that looks like it's in pieces his masterpiece. No one liked Jesus. And when you look at how he prepared this motley crew of disciples, <laughs> I love the cornerstone. I, I use it as a cornerstone, cornerstone scripture for understanding how he's preparing us as a church. And it's in John 15, verse 15. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. Jesus is saying the, w- the way he is going to build his church is through friendship with these apostles, friendship with his disciples. And out of that friendship, they're going to walk in the power of his spirit and experience a move of God because friends always share their very best with each other. See, how I approach Jesus will determine how my relationship, with is, uh, my, my relationship is with him. If I see him just as master and Lord and, and king and God, and never the one who wants to show me his affection, who wants to share secrets with me, he'll always be, yes, the awesome God that he is, but I won't actually feel the nearness of friendship that he's inviting me into. The whole book of Acts Really, it's just a narrative about how Jesus worked through his friends to make himself known in the earth. When they wrote to Theophilus, it was just writing to uh, a friend about what their encounter was, knowing and feeling the affection of Jesus. See, I believe the way he's going to restore a move of God to the earth, earth is that we trust him as Lord, he's king, he's, he's the one that rules the ends of the earth and the heavens can't contain him. But while he's omniscient and omnipotent, he's also imminent. He said, I, I want to build a church with people I can call my friends. Not worker bees, not, you know, apostles, prophets, and evangelists. All those things are necessary. But do I see myself when I come to him? as a friend or something else. When you read the the book of Acts, you see what friendship with Jesus can do. The first 30 years of church history started with a move of God. He said, go over there and wait. And when they went to Jerusalem and found themselves in the upper room, here comes a move of God, the outpouring of the Spirit. This was the first 30 years of recorded history in the church that changed the whole entire world. And as we see how this move of God happened, I want to take a page out of the book of one of Jesus' closest friends. His name is Peter. And I want Peter to help us in these next moments to answer the question, how do we have faith for a move of God? How do we have faith for a move of God? Well, if there's anybody in the scriptures that if we had a personal opportunity to ask, that we would ask, it will probably be Peter. In Matthew 16, Jesus is saying, you and all the apostles are going to become the foundation of what I'm going to build while I remain the chief cornerstone. I am the chief cornerstone, but I'm going to lay a foundation through you. Would we have done that with Peter and tax collector, the tax collectors, sinners. We, we have done this with fishermen, unlearned and uneducated. I, I don't know. But this is what Jesus did. And out of this experience of a move of God to birth the church, some people have asked, you know, well, should we ever use the book of Acts as a model for What we should expect today, I don't see anywhere in the New Testament that says we shouldn't. If he moved in this way before, certainly there is a possibility, I dare say, an expectation that we could believe signs and wonders and miracles, salvation, and most of all, disciples that know how to make disciples to go to the ends of the earth 
is the ultimate goal. Well, we see Peter giving us some instructions that relate to our modern times. In 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10, he says this, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has perceived a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. There are three things that Peter tells us that we can glean and draw from and look to as guideposts for what and how to pray for a move of God. And the three things are pray, love, and use your spiritual gifts. You see, Peter said pray because one thing that may be a little bit different in the modern mind versus the first century mind is that to be the, the disciple of a rabbi, meant you spent your life with them learning, a learner preparing to teach. But you would eat together. You would build friendship. You would have a relationship, not an institutional organizational structure that causes you to function in a spiritual way. It was a relationship that bound you together. And when Peter speaks of prayer, looking at, the record of all that Peter did and what he said and his experiences, good and bad, with, with the Lord Jesus, I have to conclude that Peter is saying prayer is not just a way to get stuff from Jesus. It's the way we give stuff to Jesus. Our will, our way, our very heart. And sometimes we come to Jesus and we want to be more than we really are. Yes, he wants your whole heart, but he'll take a broken one. He'll actually take a broken heart. And when Peter gives us this insight to pray, listen to what he says, that the end of all things is near. He's saying this is how you live in the last days. The last days are since the resurrection of, of Christ. He said be self-controlled and sober-minded because Peter is saying if you don't pray, there are things that will overtake you slowly and keep you away from the very relationship prayer keeps you growing in. To me, prayer is simply this, an opportunity to grow in friendship with Jesus, grow in relationship. Because friends talk to each other. I got, I got examples for days, as many of you have, conversations that I've had with friends that just burst and exploded with impact and, and ideas and resources. And it's no different with Jesus. He's got things that he wants to do. There's things that, but he doesn't want us to rush into the doing without the first experience of being. He called the disciples to him before he sent them. And there's a place of abiding and friendship with him. And you look at the book of Acts and see how the book of Acts they were a praying church. We're a talking church. For many of us, we, he never meant the church to become a lecture hall. If you look at the 28 chapters in the book of Acts, 18 of the 28 chapters don't teach you about prayer. They actually illustrate the impact of prayer. So prayer is one of the ways that we remain abiding in our friendship, hearing the secrets of how he wants to move and what he wants to do. And I can tell you personally, I've grown in my friendship with Jesus over the years. I have a, a million plus thousand billion. This is not even a number. I'm just making up stuff. That's how far I have to go in my friendship with Jesus. But I'm grateful that I'm going there. I remember in 2012, I was walking on a golf course in South Florida, and I was just doing what I do. I fellowship and I pray as I play golf. And I had this very disturbing in a good way impression. There's a few times in my life where I know I've heard the Lord Jesus clearly, and this was one of them. It shook me. And all I heard was walk, state, pray. Long story short, March 3rd, 
2013, after months of training and planning, I get out of an RV at the Pensacola um, City Hall building. 11 weeks and 698 miles later, I end up in South Beach, Miami, doing a prayer walk. I prayed for the state of Florida. And as I prayed, it was an occasion where I, I mobilized all of our leaders. And as I mobilized them, they prayed throughout the city during my journey. And one particular pastor prayed on UCF's campus on a Wednesday. I believe it was uh, the 13th. And he and some of the other adults prayed. And as they were praying through the campus, the Holy Spirit said, stop, pray over that dorm. And as he began to pray over that dorm, he prayed against murder and, and, and all kinds of other play, things that the realm of the dead wants to, to do to people. That next Monday, there was an attempted mass murder on that campus. It was a white boy found in the room of a man who pulled the fire alarm and wanted to get all the students out so he can murder as many people as possible. And that experience people don't know. The Wednesday before, Pastor Brian and a team prayed against that, that incident without knowing it would come. The miracle behind it is when he pulled the fire alarm, everyone began to scatter in his room. One of the uh, individuals in his, um, in his uh, quad came out and he was trying to kill this first student who ran back in the room, called 911, and it was mayhem. He had weapons, he had built bombs. He was, com uh, he was planning complete destruction. And so as we see on record that he wasn't able to do it, went back in his room and committed suicide. Well, there's a man in my church who is... Um, who has a client who is a special forces unit who, a person who goes into mass shootings. And this is his comment. The gun this young man had should have never jammed. It should have never, the gun doesn't jam. The reason he couldn't kill the student is because the gun jammed. You can't tell me that divine activity didn't participate in disrupting the destruction because of prayer. My friend Jesus told me in 2012 about praying and starting prayer walks all over the city of Orlando because he knew a move of God was needed to stop death from happening on that campus. There are students who are walking around from UCF that graduated, that have families that don't even know their lives were saved because of a friendship with Jesus. Prayer, love. See, love is a great idea until we hit a hard time and feel distant from God. It's great to feel his love when everything's working well, but I'm telling you today that people need to experience the divine love of Jesus. And what is that? It's a selfless, sacrificial love from the church is a move of God. Move of, moves of God happen in signs and wonders and miracles, but there's a move of God that happens in prayer and in love and being able to love one another in a selfless, sacrificial way is a move of God because the realm of the dead has produced so much competition and hate and political polarization and cultural division and poverty. That's what the enemy has done. And the counter culture of that, the kingdom itself, is one of selfless, sacrificial love. And if we don't understand the grace that is on us and that we're being invited to, to live like this. We'll always expect something out there to happen without expecting the move of God to happen right here on the inside of us. And then spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are supernatural endowments of grace from the Holy Spirit as he dis determines I liken it to packages. On a weekly basis, seems like a weekly basis, we get an Amazon guy, a FedEx guy, a UPS guy coming to deliver stuff. And they have never, not any one of them, has ever come up to the house and just kind of hesitated. Like, uh, should, uh, should I give you the package? Or I don't know what's in it. And 
I'm not sure if you're gonna like it. These dudes don't even think. They come up, deliver the package, and they're out. And I, I thought about that in regards to spiritual gifts because sometimes we carry spiritual gifts, but we don't deliver the package. Do you know the Holy Spirit has so many from the Father's heart? He has so many packages that are backlog in the warehouse of heaven because we don't have enough people delivering the gifts to the body. He's got love packages. There's been healings recently in our Zoom prayer meetings. I mean, from cancer to hips, injuries that have happened because we're wanting to say, Father, whatever gift you have for me, let me deliver it faithfully. And sometimes the delivery will be a gift he wants to give to the city. I want you to watch this video and I'll explain it before we close. First thing I want to say is that we're living in a miracle right now. If you've ever doubted that miracles happen, your doubts should be relieved. The miracle is that you're here for the purpose of healing from all walks of life and we're not looking to each other first for the healing we're not looking to government policies all those things will be dealt with in due time we're looking to heaven we're inviting heaven into our community today by doing this heaven's way justice respect and inclusion are at the forefront of everything that we do as a community now therefore we buddy dyer mayor of the city of orlando regina hill district five city commissioner batari burns district six city commissioner and the entire orlando city council we hereby proclaim friday june 5th 2020 as walk of morning and restoration day in the city of orlando there's a time to weep there's a time to mourn. There's a time to heal. Let's heal and let's feel. Let's heal and let's feel. Relationship. Let's build this city together. Let's turn around institutional racism. Let's talk about racial equity. The tragedies that we face in our nation can't be healed by us because they've been caused by us. And if you can't fix something with something that's broken, you have to take it back to the manufacturer. The one who made us loves us. We have not loved each other like we should. And understand today, I'm not trying to ask white people to be guilty. I'm not asking you to feel guilty. That is not what this is about. I'm not asking you to feel bad about being white. Be proud of being white. Just as you ought to be proud of being black or brown, be proud of who you are. But what I am trying to help you see is the gospel calls us to recognize the value of all people. The gospel calls us to recognize that we carry one another's burdens. And so the white community stands with the black community today and we want to carry your burden. We love each other only if we're of the same political party, the same ethnicity, the same preferences, or whatever it may be. But today we're gonna to love each other because we're human beings. Created in the image of an amazing God. I am sorry for the injustices that have happened across our nation by law enforcement I am sorry for the injustices that have happened in our own community by law enforcement to people of color. Do you realize that there, since 2014 there were 400 unjust murders just from 2014? 
And all of those need to be mourned by all of us. So what we've done is taken a hundred of those and made them the focus of our mourning today. That's wearing black. Mourning walk. Because we want the, the world to know that in Orlando, we're going to do it differently. We're going to do it differently in Orlando. So whether you're black, whether you're brown, whether you're white, whether you're the church, whether you're in the streets, whether you're business, or whether you're law enforcement, don't stop moving. Don't stop moving. Don't stop moving. The video you just saw was a miracle for our city, it was after George Floyd, whom the world saw lynched, oppressed, murdered by a police officer. The response was so gut-wrenching that there was mayhem in the streets, all over the world, protests, people crying out, destroying things. And the whole while, weeks went by, and I just said, Father, what do you want us to say? We can't necessarily go out and do that. What do you want us to say? And after a little bit of time, I was sitting in my house, and all of a sudden, I get this flood of a vision for a walk. That night, I was on the phone with the police chief and the, and the sheriff of our county and city. And in five days, we had thousands of people in the streets with no signs because we were the sign. The clergy from all different religions and backgrounds were led by a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ with a hundred names on a banner. It was a walk of mourning and restoration, a hundred names of men and women who were unjustly murdered, black men and women who were unjustly murdered. We broke up in sections and walked down a street in Orlando called Church Street. And as we walked down a mile down Church Street, we read off the names of all these victims. And in between a series of names, psalms of lament and prayers would be offered. This changed the whole atmosphere in our city because the cross street to where we assembled was church and division was the cross street. It was a prophetic message that came through the spiritual gift of faith and a vision to show God's present priorities for a whole city, not just my church, to bring healing. And it's, it's remaining to be seen the full release of how the church is going to break the division. But I do know that day there was a shift in the spirit. My hope for you and my hope for us in South Africa and all over the world is that we would believe through prayer, love, and spiritual gifts for a move of God. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance over you and give you peace. And may he keep us all until we meet again. Love you so much.